So uh, we are very happy to be back with Dr. Kuran. And uh, we actually have loads of positive comments about his lecture and his case, the chat box. Uh, and there are many special mentions to his. Uh, <laughs> And uh, as I was saying, we received a lot of positive comments about his lecture, uh, about uh, his uh, high quality teaching material. And first of uh, everything else, uh, I wanted to ask you, uh, Dr. Kuran, in this specific scenario of the teaching material in the cases, uh, about the immunohistochemistry reactions that we just observed. We know that uh, immunohistochemistry is fundamental uh, for a pathologist to sign reports from challenging cases like the ones you just presented. So uh, before we check the questions, can you comment how uh, the access to immunohistochemistry facilities work uh, in the UK for different oral pathology centers that are spread throughout uh, the island? Can you talk a little bit about that, please? Um, yeah, sure, Alan. Um, thank you for the question. Um, as you said, it's pretty essential and uh, we can't really do our job without immunohistochemistry. Um, I think things probably will change with time. Even in the UK, I remember when I first started as a junior trainee uh, in Sheffield, for example, we didn't have all the stains we wanted to do. And we were sending a lot of tests out to other labs nationally. And even now, not all the tests are available in-house. So there are some that we still have to other, uh, send to other labs in London, et cetera. But because they become so critical to diagnosis and to avoid sort of diagnostic delays, as you were mentioning, uh, a lot of the regional centers have been equipped with uh, almost most of the commonly used antibodies. And as the use has become popular, um, quality assurances also come in. So. As pathologists, our clinical practice is monitored uh, through these assessments uh, um, in the UK, which is uh, under the EQA program, which is the External Quality Assurance, in which we have to submit answers to unseen cases. And similar to that for immunohistochemistry, any lab that does uh, IHC also has to uh, submit uh, results of their tests. So they just get a list of, uh, they actually get the sent slides uh, by the governing body and they're asked to do a certain number of tests and then they stain those slides and send them nationally. Then they get scored and you get feedback on whether they were diagnostically acceptable, what was wrong with them, what things need to be changed, etc. cetera. Um, so I think in Brazil, probably things will get better with time. I'm guessing you've got more labs now than you had a few years ago that do immunohistochemistry. I mean, there are other places in the world where you may just have one or two labs in the entire country, so it would take even longer. Um, so probably with time, things will get better. Another option is, of course, to find some like-minded clinicians uh, in other countries who are helpful, who don't mind actually doing the staining for you, and you can send uh, your tissue to them, and they might just be able to do it a bit quicker if, if that's an option. Uh, but it's just one of those things where you just have to make the most of your resources. Of course, morphology still has a vital role, and then you just uh, had to narrow your diagnosis down and give a differential diagnosis. Uh, but if you can't do the test that you really want to do, then you may not be able to give a definitive diagnosis. I mean, even with immuno, sometimes we can't give a definitive diagnosis. Um, so in the UK now, the network is pretty well established. And even if we don't have it in Sheffield, we can send it to London or other places to actually get what we want. Interesting. I see. And is it the same for fish reactions or even PCI reactions? Have you yeah. Got it's even more difficult for that because the centers are... Fish is where immunohistochemistry used to be like 10, 15 years ago. So there's very few centers uh, right now in the in the UK. And most of those are associated with the uh, children hospitals. So there's a lot of sort of genetic uh, mutations and abnormalities uh, in PEDS pathology. 
uh, particularly lymphoma related. Uh, and uh, most of the fish that we do here in Sheffield is actually we send it to the children hospital, which is just across the road. Um, and uh, we are lucky that we have that facility. But again, there's probably a handful of like about eight or 10 centers in the UK where you can send your slides and get them done. Uh, if you're sending them externally, even within the UK, it might take two to three weeks to get a result back. Uh, for example, the HPV PCR that I was talking about, we have to send it to um, London. Uh, and uh, that takes about two to three weeks to get a result back. Um, so it's right now very restricted and only a handful of centers, but we're hoping with time, maybe more centers will actually uh, be doing it, which will uh, help us get a diagnosis quicker. But there are some tests, for example, you know, adenocystic carcinoma, for example, MIB uh, rearrangements. Um, there's still nowhere in the UK that does MIB rearrangement of a fish. So if you want to do that, you have to send it abroad. And there's been one or two other cases which are sort of uh, unusual cases which I've sent to America to other pathologists uh, to actually uh, help um, something that they've got said in the lab. But uh, most of the routine things we can uh, do here. All right, thank you. So let me check the questions. Uh, the first question was sent by Professor Pablo Vargas from Piracicaba Dental course. School, who asks, uh, talking about uh, translocations, uh, we have been conducting a study with MAC MAMO2 translocations, and we found it in approximately 50% of MACs. So when it comes to your uh, first case, if MAMO2 is negative, would you still sign out that case as an intraosseous MAC or not? Probably won't be as confident. <laughs> uh, but yeah, that's the problem. Uh, when uh, the MAMO2 rearrangement is present, it does make your life easier. But if it's uh, absent, then you can't be sure. You cannot be 100% sure um, that it's not a mucoepidermoid carcinoma. In this case, uh, there were other features. So um, of course, there was... Uh, something that looked like a cyst, but the presence of so many sort of squamous and epidermoid cells and clear cells, uh, and then also presence of cytoplasmic mucin uh, was quite suggestive um, that it was a mucoepidermoid carcinoma. So uh, if that was negative, we would have said that there are features which are suspicious for a mucoepidermoid carcinoma, and even though fish is negative, uh, perhaps it should be um, removed conservatively, and then we can look at the entire lesion. Uh, and perhaps uh, come to a definitive diagnosis. But when you see more than one cell type uh, and something that doesn't really fit the clinical picture, uh, then you can probably have a bit more confidence. Perfect. I'm not going to follow the specific sequence of the questions because I'll try to cluster the questions according sure. to the case. So next question uh, was sent by Professor Fabio Pires from Rio de Janeiro. He's thanking you for the very nice talk, and he's asking if you consider it pinboard tumor uh, with both cystic and clear cell areas as a differential diagnosis in the specific H and E scenario for case number one. Um, yeah, of course, that's probably the first thing you think about if it's intraosseous and looks like it's sort of closely associated to teeth, uh, but it didn't really have any amyloid-like areas. Uh, it, uh, like I said. Uh, uh, had uh, cytoplasmic mucin within it. Um, there wasn't the atypia that you usually see and the epidermoid component really didn't have the appearance that you see in uh, pinbook tumor COT. Uh, but that was definitely in the consideration for when the case was seen. Um, also, of course, this was a uh, uh, CK7 positive, diffusely CK7 positive as well. Uh, and odontogenic tumors, uh, uh, occasionally can be positive, but not uh, not diffusely. So, so it was thought of, but there were features in there, particularly the stromal hybridization, lack of any sort of heart tissue in there, um, and um, um, the presence of mucous cells, etc., that guided us in uh, the direction of a uh, mucoepidermoid carcinoma. Right now, we have uh, another question for the same case coming from South Africa, Dr. Leon Robinson is asking uh, that, he's saying that although likely an intraosseous mucopidermoid carcinoma, uh, did you consider calling this, uh, I'm sorry, do you still call it as such 
with the cortex of the mandible destroyed? Great case, by the way. Yeah, good question. Um, but when we calling it introsia, that means that its origin was in introsia. So basically, it should be called like primary uh, or central, sorry, central mucoepidermal carcinoma, which means it's arising in the bone, and all those ruptured and come out. So, I, but diagnosis didn't imply that it's still in the bone. Of course, it has come out. So that's a good point that you've raised. So central mucoepidermal carcinoma, or the origin was introsius, but it obviously is now communicating with the oral cavity. And I guess this is the last question uh, related to case number one, uh, coming from Dr. Jorge Esquiche Leon, Ribeirão Preto. Dr. Curran, in your experience, what is the frequency of mom, mom on two translocation in intraosseous versus salivary gland max? What is the difference in terms of frequency? Uh, I would love to tell you, but I've so far only ever seen one intraosseous mech in real life. I've seen them in study sets but I've only ever seen one. So um, I think the problem with the intraosseous one can be that if the specimen has been decalcified, then the diagnosis can become difficult because fish or PCL may not work. So that's quite a key sort of uh, um, uh, thing to remember. Uh, but uh, I'm not sure the literature is shown. Uh, I think most of the intraosseous or central mucoepidermal carcinoma are low grade and most low grade uh, mucoeps uh, tend to show or 70% almost show the mammal to rearrangement. So I would expect most of them uh, to show that. Um, but yeah, I don't, I don't have a definite answer for your, for your question, unfortunately. But it's, it's a good point. I'll, I'll definitely look into that to see if there's any evidence that they're different. Mm -hmm. So the next question was sent by Professor Willy Van Huden, University of Pretoria in South Africa. Ali, what is your opinion on calling this as a solid sclerosing polycystic adenoma? Um, I think I'll have to get in touch with Willy so he can educate me on what a solid sclerosing polycystic uh, adenoma is. I mean, by solid, I'm guessing he's suggesting that there's not a lot of cystic component to it. Um, and then by adenoma, of course, there's the debate going on whether this is actually a reactive phenomenon or is, it, is this a neoplasm? And there's emerging evidence uh, of this uh, human antigen receptor monoclonality. So my feeling is that in the next few classifications, this will be classified as a neoplasm and will be called an adenoma. Um, so I didn't think about calling it solid, of course. I mean, there's some cystic areas, not that many, um, but um, like I said, I'll probably just... Uh, need to be taught by Willy. Maybe I'm sure he's seen more than me, uh, but I haven't come across a solid one so far. So that's why we just call it uh, sclerosing polycystic adenosis. Uh, even in the palate, it's quite, it's quite rare itself. So the people who actually referred it uh, uh, were querying or was thinking of a carcinoma, pleomorphic adenoma uh, because of the atypia, but the atypia can be seen quite commonly in these lesions. Um, but uh, it is actually a reactive lesion and, and things like E67, uh, can be quite useful in actually helping you. All right, Ali, now I'll have to change the plans because there are so many questions and we are going uh, just go for it. backwards in different okay. cases. So I'll we'll just try to follow the sequence now. So, uh, okay. Excuse me. So next question was again made by uh, Jorge Esquiche Leon. And he's asking about case number four. What uh, the histological type of cutaneous uh, BCC? Is it important in terms of prognostic uh, impact? Um, yes, that's a very good question. So I did uh, find the original and we also reviewed the histology of the original and that showed an infiltrative uh, type uh, basal cell carcinoma. So they are, of course, at a higher risk um, uh, and are much more likely to recur uh, than uh, like uh, multinodular or um, nodular sort of BCCs. Um, so the prognosis is imp important. Uh, if you look at the morphic and infiltrative variants or basosquamous variants of BCC, they are much more likely to recur and also uh, slightly more likely to metastasize. 
it's quite rare to get a metastasis anyway, but if she do get a metastasis, it's usually related to one of those subtypes, the more aggressive subtypes. We have actually published this as a case report as well, so you can search for it on, uh, on PubMed and uh, read a bit more about it. All right, now one last question from the same professional, Jorge. Case number five, which is the antibody, the clone itself used? You can comment on the pattern of nuclear staining. Did the tumor have areas uh, of sebaceous differentiation? Uh, case five is the nut carcinoma, if I'm yes, right. Yeah? It, yeah. Mm -hmm. So this is an antibody that's uh, available at the Royal Marston Hospital in London. Um, so, um, and I think this was originally developed uh, back in 2009, and there was a paper in the American Journal of Surgical Pathology. Uh, so apparently even the fish test available uh, can miss sometimes some of the cases, uh, unless it's specifically targeted uh, fish probes. And what they showed was that this uh, specifically designed uh, monoclonal antibody, um, which is specific to NUT, uh, is very sensitive in identifying these cases. And Royal Marsden have taken that antibody and actually uh, developed that, and they use that as their go-to antibody uh, for that. I don't uh, know the clone of it, but if you want, I can share the paper. It was, like I said, it was published in 2009 in the American Journal of Surgical Pathology, uh, and uh, uh, Christopher French was the, the lead author on that. Um, so is that antibody that's been further developed uh, by the hospital where I sent it? It wasn't available in Sheffield. Good. And in terms of sebaceous differentiation, uh, that's again a very good question. So first time when we looked at those cases, which looked slightly epidermoid, but also showed slight clearing and we thought, could it be sebaceous? Uh, and um, androgen receptor was negative. EMA was negative in those uh, epithelial islands as well. So that ruled out the, that they were actually sebaceous in the region. So the next question was uh, sent by Dr. Sergio Vitorino Cardozo from Minas Gerais. And he's asking if you could comment on the differential diagnosis between SPAY and saliva reduced carcinoma. So, um... Good question. They can look very similar. Uh, salivary duct carcinoma tends to show a lot more atypia. So probably one of the few salivary lens tumors that shows frank dysplasia also shows necrosis. Uh, necrosis is not really a feature of sclerosing polycystic adenosis. Um, although you can get a cribriform appearance, you don't tend to see the Roman bridging and that you see in salivary duct carcinoma. Uh, the thing that's sort of more closer to salivary duct carcinoma is intraductal carcinoma. They can be very similar. Uh, but in interductal carcinomas, of course, you've got an intact uh, rim of myopathial cells surrounding all the epithelial islands. Um, other things are, of course, high K67 uh, index. So slavida carcinoma is usually quite aggressive and very proliferative. Uh, and also you will see invasion into the adjacent structures as well, which is something you don't see in a sclerosing polycystic adenosis. Immunophenotype is similar in the sense that it will express androgen receptor and this um, um, HER2, et cetera. Uh, but uh, other than that, uh, there are a few differences that can help you. Another question coming from Dr. Robinson, South Africa, case number nine, uh, the Mucopeter mode carcinoma warting like. He's asking, uh, whether you considered using a CAN 5.2 to distinguish a true lymph node from top in a tumor? I haven't done it personally myself. I know there was a paper that recently came out uh, from um, Dr. Bishop's group, uh, which has shown the CAN 5.2 can be quite useful uh, in differentiating between uh, true nodes and tumor associated lymphoid proliferations. Uh, but uh, uh, we haven't used that. I haven't, haven't used that. Uh, in this case, um, we didn't say or suggest that it was in a lymph node. It just looked like a tumor-associated lymph proliferation rather than a lymph node. Uh, there was no obvious capsule around it. Uh, and uh, you are aware that you can get a similar sort of infiltrate in other tumors like a cynic cell carcinoma as well. It can almost look like a lymph node. Uh, but uh, cases where you have got suspicion, it looks like that using CAM 5.2 can be helpful but I don't have any experience of that. Okay, I'm going to combine 
uh, both of the next questions, which were uh, sent by Dr. Luciano Castro from Goiás State in Brazil. He's asking your personal professional opinion on the use of FNAC uh, as a diagnostic tool in the specific context of intraoral minor salivary gland tumors. And if you have any uh, preference or recommendation for clinicians as an orthopologist uh, in terms of uh, doing the incisional biopsy technique in intraoral, intraoral lumps suspected uh, of salivary gland tumors. Um, thank you for the question. It's a question that I feel very sensitive about, uh, and my answer would be the same as uh, Professor Spade probably would have said, uh, that uh, never do intraoral FNAs. Um, uh, so salivary gland tumors are already quite challenging enough, and intraorally you do have decent access, and it's always a good idea to do a proper scalpel biopsy to obtain a decent amount of tissue in case you can you want to do immunohistochemistry or even molecular work. Um, FNAs are a bit hit and miss. Uh, you don't always see the morphology and even in one tumor, you can see different morphologies. Uh, so when you have the option to actually do a proper uh, surgical biopsy, I would always recommend that clinicians actually go for that. Even in parotid and um, submandibular glands, uh, a core biopsy is much preferable than uh, an FNA, just because it gives you more tissue and you're more likely to get to the right diagnosis. Um, and that's, that's what was hammered into me by uh, Prof. Spate, and uh, I, I believe that very strongly. The next question was sent by Ana Luisa Rosa, a PhD student at Plas Cabarento School. Once again, he's mentioning case number two, and she's asking if you consider it sclerosing microcystic adenocarcinoma during the differential uh, diagnosis and workup? Uh, thank you for the question. And I didn't really have the morphology of a, a microcystic uh, carcinoma. It's uh, again, another recently described entity. Uh, the sort of apocrine change was just so prominent in it. Also the, the sclerosis, um, the immunophenotype was different as well. So uh, microcystic uh, adenocarcinomas have got a similar immunophenotype to uh, polymorphous adenocarcinoma. So they're diffusely S100 positive. They don't have the double layer of cells, the P63 positive as well. Uh, and so um, we didn't really feel like that it had the features um, of uh, microcystic adenocarcinoma. So um, that's why we didn't uh, consider it. Ana Luiz is also asking uh, a question about case number nine. She's asking whether you consider it a malignant transformation of Wharton's tumor. And she ends up saying that she learned so much and thank you. Oh, thank you. Um, uh, did consider a malignant transformation of Wharton's. I'm not sure how many case reports there are of mucoepidermoid carcinomas arising in a Wharton tumor, uh, but it's been shown quite uh, in quite sort of good case series and studies, uh, this entity, the warting like mucoepidermoid carcinoma. I mean, nowhere in the tumor actually we had the typical warting like features. There was the lymphoid infiltrate, but uh, the epithelial lining was not oncocytic anywhere. Uh, and it was uh, either squamous or sort of cuboidal. And there were just too many epidermoid areas uh, and too many sort of mucous cells in it. Um, and uh, now because it's a recognized entity, we we actually believe that that's what it was and that it didn't arise in a Wharton tumor. Next question was sent by Dr. Irene Lafuente Ibanez from Spain. She's congratulating you for such uh, a very uh, interesting selection of cases. And she's asking if uh, the patient was tested for HIV in this is specific that the Kaposi sarcoma patient. I'm sorry, this is about case nine. She's, yeah. she's, uh, she's also saying that the differential diagnosis would be HIV related cystic lymphoid hyperplasia. Okay. Sorry. Um, HIV test, uh, I'm not sure whether it was performed um, uh, because it was a consult case, it came from somewhere else, so I don't have that information, but it's, it's, a, it's a good point, and that's definitely in the differential. Uh, there is definitely lymphoid hyperplasia and there's cystic component, but the epithelial component is very sort of prominent. And once you start to see it, um, 
then you identify and uh, realize the patterns within it. Um, and um, I would recommend reading uh, that uh, case series uh, by Justin Bishop's group, which actually described this entity. And um, we felt like there was too much of epithelial proliferation in there and coupled with the fish uh, positivity as well as the mucus cells and the clear cells and the squamous cells. Uh, it's fitted with that category, but definitely at first look, when you look at it, um, HIV related uh, lymphoid hyperplasia or sort of uh, uh, lesion would be definitely in the differential. Bruno Maris, uh, a PhD student from Piracicaba Dental School, is thanking you for sharing uh, these outstanding cases. And he asks, how often do you use P16 in salivary gland tumors? And also, in case 10, could you comment on the possibility of myoepithelial carcinoma X pleomorphic adenoma? Um, thank you for the question. P16 in salivary gland tumors are hardly ever used because it can show up as positive in quite a few cases, which makes your life more difficult. So I think P16 is useful in the right context. But unless you've got something which is in the sinonasal or oropharyngeal region, uh, then uh, I usually do not use P16 because I believe it confuses you rather than helping you. Uh, case 10 is actually a referral case that was sent to Professor Spate. Uh, so I remember looking at uh, it with him. Um, I think myopathial carcinoma is, is a fair shout, but it was... Uh, the only thing that it was positive for that spindle cell component in that uh, case was Vermentin. It wasn't positive for uh, CK7 and uh, it wasn't positive for any other markers. And we just felt like it was a distinct sort of mesenchymal appearance uh, rather than a salivary uh, appearance. And that's why we, uh, I think, prospate went with that uh, uh, carcinosarcoma XPA. But I think it's a good child, myopathelial carcinoma uh, XPA. Uh, definitely would be the only other possibility. Now we have a question from Dr. Hene Hara from Chile. He's talking about case number 10. I think it's the same question, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> so again, I would say, yeah, that's a, that's a good point. Um, high grade transformation in the myopathial carcinoma, we didn't believe it was that just because there was an obvious pleomorphic adenoma uh, like lesion in the background, there was a lot of ductal structures and the presence of ductal structures actually rules out uh, um, uh, a myopithelioma. Um, so that's one of the reasons we didn't consider uh, myopithelial carcinoma with high grade transformation. So uh, Dr. Sergio Cardozo is asking, how do you prompt yourself to avoid the usual suspects? <laughs> Oh, that's a good question. Uh, I guess you just have to take a step back. If you are not sure, then don't rush into a decision and also don't make any judgments. Most of the time, the clinician would have suggested something and uh, uh, try to keep an open mind and let the clues guide you. Uh, but also look at the radiology, look at the imaging or any other clinical information, clinical photographs, whatever you can get your hands on because uh, um, it helps you. Uh, any information to get a sort of bigger picture, a sort of um, holistic picture of, of what might be going on. But everyone, uh, no one knows everything. Everyone mis makes mistakes. And uh, I, uh, I'm i sure I miss things as well. But these are just some of the examples where you feel like things could have been missed, but weren't missed. Uh, but what you see is the easy version of it. What you don't see is the weeks of work that went behind to get to the diagnosis particularly the nut carcinoma was quite challenging. And as I was telling you, I wasn't really sure what to call it. And you're just struggling and thinking, is it like a neuroendocrine carcinoma or a slavic gland tumor with high grade transformation? And uh, it's sometimes you just get that sort of light bulb moment, you know, and it was just one of those things in the middle of the night uh, that I thought, oh, I've just realized that I didn't consider a nut carcinoma and that P16 positivity in a slavic gland tumor um, particularly with those areas of abrupt squamous differentiation would be typical of that. Um, so I think the important thing is to keep an open mind, discuss with colleagues as well. So if you've got any seniors uh, locally, discuss with them or any other colleagues. Uh, two pairs of eyes are better than one. So you may be missing something that other people 
uh, can see. Uh, and um, those are the things that I can suggest or I, I sort of use um, to actually just make sure that I'm not missing anything. And the next question was sent by Dr. Siska Mari from South Africa. She's, she's thanking you for sharing stunning cases. And uh, again, she's talking about case number 10. And she's asking if it is necessary to specify the carcinomatous and the sarcomatous components, specifically because some areas resemble myoepithelial carcinomas. Thank you. Yeah, that's a very good point. Most of the time, if you can, uh, or if we can, we try to give the um, details of the carcinomatous component. So whether it's a myoepithelial carcinoma or um, you see adenoid cystic carcinoma quite a lot uh, in a carcinoma XPA. Um, in this case, we didn't. Uh, I mean, even if, if you get a carcinosarcoma, uh, the sarcomatous component also usually uh, has been sort of documented to be a certain type of sarcoma. Um, and in this case, it didn't really fit any pattern. I think the closest it probably would have come to like a sarcoma NOS or maybe a fibrosarcoma, but it wasn't really typical of any one type of sarcoma. Um, but yes, if you can, and if we can, then we do try to specify it. I guess it can help you in terms of prognosis uh, of what type of carcinoma is in there, but it's sort of balanced by the fact whether you can tell if the carcinoma XPA is all within the capsule or how far beyond the capsule it is, because it's been shown now that that's actually more important for prognosis than uh, mentioning the type of the carcinomatous component that's in the tumor. And that patient actually, despite having a carcinosarcoma, uh, until uh, well, the most recent information that we have uh, didn't have any recurrence. Professor Marcio Ajudarte Lopez from, from Piracicaba Dental School is also thanking you for your presentation. And he is asking if you could explain how to differentiate what is tumor like mucopeter mode carcinoma from a mucopeter mode carcinoma arising in a warting tumor? Um, I guess that would be impossible. <laughs> um, I'm not sure whether uh, there is any definite cases uh, of true mucopidermoids arising in warting tumor. And historically, the cases that people thought were arising in warting tumor perhaps were always warting like mucopidermoid carcinomas. But I've never seen a mucopidermoid carcinoma arising in a warting, but I'm guessing if it was true, then it would be very difficult, if not impossible. Uh, the thing that would probably help you is trying to look for some warting like areas. So actually looking for that bilayered oncocytic uh, epithelial lining, uh, which was lacking in this case. Um, but other than that, I think it would be very challenging if you actually did get uh, these tumors developing in a warting tumor. I don't believe that's the case. And I believe historically everything that's been called that are probably warting like mucoeps. Yeah, okay. Uh, Professor Benjamin Martinez from Chile. He's also thank you for the thanking you for the presentation, and he's asking about the Langerhans cells, uh, cell histostasis cases. He says that sometimes the lesions are polyostotic, and he's asking for more information about the mandible lesion. Yeah, in this case, it wasn't polyostotic; it was just one lesion. Um, so uh, that was the only lesion. Um, but uh, of course, we raise the possibility when you actually look at the histology. But uh, in this case, it was just an isolated lesion. And then Dr. Sibeli Aquino from Minas Gerais uh, is saying that the cases are excellent. And if you could uh, talk a little bit more about uh, uh, eventual morphological characteristics of nut carcinomas that may rise suspicion. So um, like I sort of showed in the presentation, uh, I think the features, of course, if you get something that is very sort of undifferentiated, uh, almost looks like the lymphoid or neuroendocrine, uh, then you can start suspecting that. But look for those areas of abrupt squamous change. So you've got this background of small round blue cells, undifferentiated cells, and within that you get these either clear cells or almost squamous looking cells and little sort of um, ball-like structures. Uh, and if you're seeing that, then you should straight away suspect uh, a nut carcinoma, because that's a very typical feature of a nut carcinoma. Um, other than that, 
I don't think there's that many specific features. Of course, you can do immunohistochemistry to help you. I mean, P16 has been shown to be positive in about 40% of the cases. It's not usually positive in many salivary gland tumors. But then this also raises the possibility of uh, a metastasis from somewhere, I guess. But I would go for the, the most important feature, which is the abrupt squamous differentiation and those areas uh, with quite clear sort of... Um, let me see if I can uh, share the slide with you. What case number was it? Uh, sorry, let me double check. Number five, case number five. Okay, hold on. Let me see here. Okay. And then of course it will have high grade features, so it will have necrosis as well. So that's another thing that you don't see in many salivary gland tumors. Uh, can I share my screen? Let me ask the support of you. Oh, yeah. Okay. So here you can see, so this is like the background lesion, which is these small round blue cells. And then you can see this very abrupt change to these sort of vacuolated cells, almost sort of showing clearing, but also looking slightly squamous as well. And the more you sort of start seeing them, the more you realize that there's quite a few of them but it's quite important to identify areas like this and this sort of really sort of sudden change from this morphology to this squamous morphology. So, uh, Maria Eduarda Perez de Oliveira, another PhD student from Piracicaba Dental School, is thanking you for your uh, special work. And she's asking two questions. First one, uh, I would like to know in your experience how often cholesterol crystals are observed in, my, in, in mucopeter mode carcinomas. And I second said, one, yeah, I'm, please carry on. Excuse me. Second one, could you comment about the degree of pleomorphism in Langerhans cells histiocytosis? Thank you. Um, so cholesterol clefts, you don't really tend to see uh, in equipidomoid carcinomas, not many are central. And basically they're not specific to, as many people think they're specific to a ridiculous cyst. They can be seen in any condition that's got inflammation. And the fact uh, is that in this uh, case, because there was bone resorption and communication with the oral cavity, there was secondary inflammation. As a result of that, we were seeing uh, the cholesterol cleft. So it wasn't really a mucoepidermoid sort of feature. It was more like an inflammation related feature. Um, and the degree of pleomorphism, um, not so much. I mean, you see these cells and you can see some variation in them. They're not always atypical. Uh, the important thing is to identify them. When you see a lot of eosinophils, they start looking for pale cells with the central groove or coffee bean-like nuclei. Um, and I wouldn't say that they look very atypical or very pleomorphic, uh, but there's quite a lot of them. So just identifying the presence of them is enough. It's not just uh, about uh, the pleomorphic appearance. So the next question was sent by Paola Aristizabo, PhD student at Escabaneta School. Due to the morphological similarities between GOC and low-grade MAC, are there immunohistochemistry reactions that help in the differential diagnosis? Uh, immuno, probably there's no immuno that can help you. That's a very good question because that's the uh, diagnostic dilemma, isn't it? Uh, they can look very similar. Uh, so immunohistochemistry would be very similar. They will both probably have some sort of uh, uh, mucus uh, sort of cell component. So you'll have to look for morphology. First of all, in mucoepidermoid carcinoma, look for more than one cell type, okay? If you're getting clear cell changes or you're getting sort of intermediate um, or epidermoid cells, uh, then think about that in the GOC, think about the sort of plaque-like thickenings, et cetera. And then of course you have fish and fish can probably help you uh, if it is positive. If it's not positive, then you may not, you, you may struggle, but if it's positive, then that can probably help you as well. Yeah, Paula just complimented the question saying, uh, or is it necessary to perform fish analysis to confirm mom? Yeah, it, it is very helpful, yeah. 
So next question was sent by Professor Osley Paisi Almeida, the Escabarento School. He says, thank you, Dr. Ali, very nice presentation. Please, uh, as the term implies multi-phenotypic carcinoma, were described up to now only in the sinonasal tract, all cases must be adenoid cystic component? Um, yeah, so far, I think pretty much all the cases that have been described are in the sinonasal tract. Uh, most in the nasal tract, some in the sinus. Uh, you get this evidence of surface dysplasia as well. And almost always you get adenoid cystic carcinoma. You definitely get this adenoid cystic carcinoma-like component. It may not be as prominently cribriform. It may be a bit more solid looking, uh, but you, you do get the sort of multiple appearances uh, if you like. So squamous looking areas and adenoid cystic or adenocarcinoma looking areas almost we're thinking about an adenosquamous carcinoma, of course, the differential, which is what we were thinking initially, but then that wouldn't have the diffuse P16 positivity and uh, HPV positivity. Mm -hmm. There is also a complement of this question from Professor Osley. He says that uh, he's asking, can it be the correspondent of the oropharyngeal HPV carcinoma? And last, sorry, how it is supposed uh, to understand that the HPV was acquired in the sinonasal tract. And he ends up saying uh, regards to Professor Paul's Um That's a good question. Uh, I'm not entirely sure. I guess, I mean, oropharyngeal tract, it would be quite similar. Um, I mean, yeah, there's the usual sort of sexual route of trans transmission. So uh, that's one, but uh, it is possible that uh, uh, it can be sort of transferred or moved on from uh, one side to another. Um, in the nose, this, this is a good question, how are you getting sort of HPV in the nose? Uh, it is probably coming from the sinus uh, or the oropharynx, but uh, I don't think anyone has actually done their work and shown that. So uh, um, the true, true answer is that we don't know. Can I ask you something about this same case, Ali? Yeah, of course. Uh, we, we understand that HPV-related head and neck squamous cell carcinoma is considered pandemic, right? Uh, however, the, 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 the global prevalence of the disease uh, is apparently quite variable. We have countries reporting 70%, 75% of all oropharyngeal squamous cell carcinoma being HPV positive. Uh, we have other countries with less than 10%. So uh, I was wondering if you could comment what's the panorama in the UK in this specific sense in terms of prevalence of uh, oropharyngeal HPV associated non-keratinizing squamous cell carcinoma. And, and in terms of real life, how often do you receive cases of this nature on your own routine uh, as an oropathologist? Uh, that's a very good question. You're right, there's a quite marked variability. And I think it's a lot more common in the West, uh, in the more developed countries, uh, than it is in the less developed countries for some reason. Um, and there can be multiple reasons for it. Of course, availability of testing is, is one issue. Uh, then of course, social, cultural differences, lifestyle habits are different. Uh, in the UK, it's definitely exploded in numbers. Uh, I remember about, uh, five, 10 years ago, it was felt like that the number has almost increased by like twice because of uh, oropharyngeal or HPV related carcinomas. But the recent numbers which have been released uh, show that there's been at least a 15% uh, increase which is HPV related in, for head and neck cancers. And on our practice, uh, I would say we see one to two every week now. So conventional squamous cell carcinoma, maybe we see three to four or five, uh, but we get at least one on average every week, if not two. So it's definitely becoming a lot more common. I see. Thank you. So Ali, we've got uh, approximately 10 questions to go. Can we keep going? Yeah. Good. Another question from Paola, Paola Aristizabo. She says, uh, the presence of cholesterol clefts in case number one would indicate the pre-existence of an odontogenic cyst or the presence of cholesterol clefts is, is just normal in a MEC. 
Thank you. I, th I think I sort of partly answered that question earlier. Um, and just because cholesterol cluster present, we can't assume that this was an odontogenic cyst. And I think in this case, they're present because of the bony rupture and the lesion communicating with the oral cavity and as a result of that, the inflammation. Um, so otherwise, cholesterol clefts are not common in a mucoepidermal carcinoma, but any lesion which has got uh, a strong or heavy inflammatory component and particularly related to the jaws and communicating with the oral cavity can show cholesterol clefts. Next question sent by Philippe Martins Silveira from Rio Grande do Sul, but he's a PhD student at Piracicaba. I would like to know if we should expect some areas of cellular pleomorphism and hyperchromatism in cases of spade, as noted in case two. Yes, thank you. Good question. Almost always you see some atypia, some pleomorphism and hyperchromatism in a sclerosing polycystic adenosis, which is what makes the diagnosis difficult. Because when you see it, you start to, start to think about a carcinoma, a pleomorphic adenoma. But if you did a key 67 immunohistochemistry, it would usually be around 1% to 2%. Um, so the atypia doesn't really sort of, um, it's more considered to be reactive atypia. Uh, and it doesn't really sort of transform into um, uh, or translate to the sort of aggressive uh, features or behavior. Uh, but it's quite a good feature to remember that if you're seeing a lesion, but if you're seeing a lot of fibrosis uh, and sclerosis and apocrine changes, and um, and then you're seeing some atypia, it's always worth thinking about a sclerosing polycystic adenosis. Next question sent by Ivan Neto, Alagoas, Brazil. Amazing lecture, Dr. Curran. Why didn't you consider the useful of CD10 to exclude hyalizing clear cell carcinoma as a differential diagnosis in case number three? Metastasis of OCC. So CD10 is not specific to hyaluronizing clear cell carcinoma as far as I know. I mean, CD10 you can do to actually for renal cell carcinomas. It is positive in them as well. We did think about hyaluronizing clear cell carcinoma initially, but it didn't have any of the hyaluronizing components. Uh, it didn't look like it was actually arising from the parotid tissue. It looked like it was sitting in some sort of a, uh, a node and there was vascular invasion as well. Clear cell carcinomas usually, uh, you don't get to see that. Uh, and also the background, how vascular it was, straight away sort of highlighted um, uh, and showed uh, that it was something which is more likely to be renal. Uh, the referring pathologist did think that it could be a mucoepidermoid carcinoma uh, and mammal uh, fish was negative, but the morphology in this case, was very typical of a renal cell carcinoma. And also, because cytokatin 7 is negative, um, it just excludes the salivary gland neoplasm. Karin Gallagher from Asuncion, Paraguay, also a PhD student in Piracicaba. She says, uh, it was an excellent lecture, Dr. Curran, thank you. Uh, and the question is, do you know if there is any difference in the prognostic of clinical behavior in sinonasal carcinoma related to HPV 33 uh, when compared to type 16? I think they've all got very good prognosis. So, so far what's been shown uh, is that although these lesions look quite aggressive, they behave quite well. Um, some cases have shown to metastasize, but I don't think there have been any reported deaths as a result of this. Uh, both HPV 16, um, 33, as well as 18, they're all considered high risk, but in this case, um, the tumor itself is quite low grade. Next Does question. The question. I'm sorry, yeah, sure, sure, I'm sorry. The next question was sent by Dr. Rogério Gondac, Florianopolis. Uh, Dr. Ali, do you consider including PAX2, PAX8, CD10 markers in cases of suspected renal neoplasms? Yes, we do. Thank you. That's a good question. Uh, we did do PAX8 and CD10 in this case later on as well, and they were positive. Uh, so yeah, we do. Because RCC uh, antibody is not the best, and it doesn't always work. So it's always a good idea to do a combination of markers. 
Professor Benjamin Martinez from Chile is asking about the frequencies uh, and also the answers for each case because we uh, we turn it available the, the link. Uh, we're going to to speak with Professor Manuela and we're going to to set up uh, this presentation with the the most important uh, the most frequent answers, Professor Benjamin. Yeah, I've got the I've got all the answers that were submitted. So if you want, then I can share that with you. Can you help us to make this, this available? Of course. Next question sent by Hedison Lima Souza, PhD student from Piracicaba Dental School. He starts saying that, uh, thank you for sharing such interesting cases with us. Do you see the degree of capsule invasion for diagnosis of carcinoma XPA? Yes, absolutely. So you should give an idea of where the carcinoma is. So is it all intracapsular, which means it hasn't invaded the capsule? Uh, is it within the capsule or has it actually invaded beyond the capsule? So because the prognostically it's been shown that tumors are actually gone um, four to six millimeter beyond the capsule have got the worst prognosis. And I think the new WHO uh, head and neck book actually takes that into account as well, that where possible you should try and comment on the degree of capsular invasion. Uh, and whether the tumor is embedded into the surrounding uh, salivary tissue. So yes, it's definitely the degree of capsular invasion is very important. Mm -hmm. In this same question, Karin Gallagher uh, is asking uh, if the presence of spindle cells could be related to the differentiation that occurs in some salivary gland tumors. Yeah, it could be. Because of, of course they are coming from a salivary gland tumor and a lot of people suggested myopathial cell and it's very possible that actually originated in my myopathial cells and they become de-differentiated into, uh, into something like this. Um, so um, yeah, that's uh, very probable and a good, um, good point. Another question from South Africa from Dr. Siska Mary. Can I mention uh, that Professor Spate has just put a comment on that he's listening and he's also saying never do an FNA on an intraoral lesion. <laughs> all the best to Professor Spate. Thank you very much, Professor Spate. He's, all, he, he's always on, right? <laughs> yeah. So, Professor Kuran, what is your experience of mama L2 translocations uh, in different variants of MAC? Um, I think on average what's been shown is about 70 to 80 percent of the cases uh, are positive. Um, and my experience, the, the usually low to intermediate grade tumors almost always show it. Um, and some high grade tumors show it and some don't. Um, but I would say on average about 70 to 80 percent cases would be positive uh, with more likely uh, to be positive in the low to intermediate grade than high grade. All right, next question sent by Ana Luisa Araujo, our PhD student here from Piracicaba. Just spent some time with you in Sheffield. Thank you, by the way, once again. Thank you for sharing, Ali, unusual suspects, indeed. Can you comment on the differential diagnosis you considered when evaluating case number 13 prior to the immunohistochemical stainings uh, and clinical information regarding the new, the new original site? Uh that's the case with the metastasis, right? Yep. Yes, the metastatic esophagus adenocarcinoma, yes. So I think the morphology was very typical. Uh, the columnar uh, cells that, uh, that we saw, uh, I looked straight away uh, that it was a metastasis and then it was a matter of establishing where the, uh, the met was coming from. Um, one thing to, of course, consider is always a salivary gland tumor of some sort. So you, you do take that into account. And then after that, you think about an adenocarcinoma and what's the possibility. So depending on, of course, the patient, then you think about things like thyroid and, and breast and lung. Um, the columnar morphology was very typical of a GI-related uh, tumor. So that's why uh, we actually straight away thought that that was the more likely uh, possibility. So you before the question gave me, you know, yeah, you should have an idea of what you think it might be. Excuse me. She just complimented saying that at the first sight, the dirty necros necrosis made her think about a colorectal adenocarcinoma. Yeah, I agree with that. Colorectal was my first uh, choice as well. 
provisional diagnosis was colorectal. Um, and I actually did question uh, and raise the possibility, uh, but uh, the morphology was identical to the, the recently removed uh, esophagus tumor, which actually showed intestinal type changes. Um, and in the end, it was agreed that it was a metastasis from that. But I would agree that my first uh, feeling was this was a colorectal tumor. Mm -hmm. Dr. Mario Homanyash from the University of uh, Rio de Janeiro, Federal University of Rio de Janeiro. Thank you, Ali. Great cases and presentation. Uh, about case number 12, how frequent is secondary candida infection overlying HIV associated Kaposi sarcoma and whether it can result in a different clinical appearance? Uh, thank you. I'm not sure how second frequent it is, but you would think that if the patient is immunocompromised, then um, they would be quite likely to have candida. But even if candida was present, you would think that it will uh, more likely cause changes in the epithelium. And in this case, the tumor that we've got is actually mesenchymal. Um, so I think probably in the grand scheme of things, it probably wouldn't make a big difference if there was candida on the surface or not, because this is like a connective tissue or soft tissue tumor. But my feeling is it, it you might see it in quite a few of them. So the last question was sent by Professor Nasir Said Al Nayef from Oregon, the US. Eosinophil poor variant of Langergan cells histiocytosis. Your take on it, Sketchred CD1A positive cells only uh, would it be suspicious for diagnosing uh, of Langerhans cells is just causes or just incidental? Great presentation, great differential. Can you just repeat the question again, Alan? Sorry. Sure. I'm just going to, to text it to you too. So it was in a few poor variant of Langerhans cell histiocytosis. Question mark. Your take on it, scattered CD1A positive cells only. Would you be suspic suspicious for uh, diagnosis of Langerhans cell I histiocytosis see. or incidental? I see. So yeah, they're saying that there's not that many um, Langerhans cells in there. And that's, that's a... That's a good point because some, most of the time you see a lot more than that. It, it can be incidental, but that typical sort of appearance uh, that you've got uh, uh, with the, um, in this case, of course, eosinophils, but I haven't seen many eosinophilic poor variants of LCH. So to me, it's always been the guiding feature. When I see a lot of eosinophils, I start looking for Langerhans cells. Uh, but uh, I, I'm assuming that if it's an eosinophilic poor variant, then it, the diagnosis would be quite challenging. I think that's where the radiology comes in. It can be very useful and helpful. If you get the moth eaten appearance and you feel like that the teeth are almost like floating, and then it's always worth just sort of remembering that and considering that and looking into it. Um, if you just got like two or three or a few scattered cells, then it could be incidental, I guess. But uh, um, in the picture I've sent, probably there were a few, but uh, in reality, there was a lot more than that. All right, Ali, uh, these are all the questions we had. Uh, have you got any final remarks? Um, no, I would just like to say thanks to you and Manuela uh, for asking me to speak. And uh, thanks to um, all of you who were listening. Um, cases were, of course, from um, all over the UK, some from outside. Most of them were mine. Some, of course, uh, carried various due. There were the two cases, particularly the carcinosarcoma and the fetal rhabdomyoma case, uh, which are uh, from Professor Spate. Um, and uh, I just thought it would just uh, uh, hopefully was uh, good enough or interesting enough uh, set for you. Um, just reminding you of the importance of just looking for the unusual suspects. Absolutely, Ali. Absolutely. Many thanks for uh, delivering such a great presentation. Uh, this, as you know, this is uh, our first digital meeting. So your hard work improved the visibility of the meeting and we cannot thank you enough for being so supportive, 
for being so available for our society, Ali. Thank you so much once again on behalf of our society. No problem at uh, all. Thank you very much. We also take this opportunity, Ali, uh, uh, to thank all the members of the oral and maxillofacial pathology department at the University of Sheffield. Uh, as you know, you hosted so many Brazilians during the past uh, 15 ish years since Pablo started formally the connection. So many people uh, supported Pablo to get to Sheffield, sure. So uh, I want to, to mention once again the name of Professor Paul Spate, but, but uh, obviously the entire group has been extremely supportive with us and, and you became an important collaborator of, of SOBEP itself. Uh, so many of you came to the uh, meetings and hosted students, hosted professors. So once again, thank you very much on behalf of SOBEP uh, for being so close to our group in Brazil. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ali. So I hope to see you soon in the new, in the near future. See you soon. Cheers, bye. Bye bye. Eu tenho apenas alguns comentários finais uh, relacionados aqui à nossa reunião, representando a professora Manuela Domingues Martins. Uh, lembrando que agora às 14 horas nós teremos a palestra do professor Pablo Vargas sobre punção aspirativa por agulha fina. E nós teremos também a mediação do professor Mário Romanache nesse contexto. Às 19 horas, hoje também, nós teremos a palestra da professora Érica uh, Silveira, que será mediada pelo professor Vinícius Carrar, no contexto da quelite actínica. E um lembrete final é que, uh, ao final da última palestra, do último dia do evento, que é amanhã, a palestra do professor César Migliorati, nós teremos o sorteio de uma câmera óptica, é uma câmera bastante uh, valiosa pela perspectiva técnica dela, inclusive financeira, também um equipamento de, de um custo alto, que foi oferecido pela óptica em termos de suporte para a divulgação do nosso evento. E, finalmente, então, agradecer os parceiros todos comerciais dessa jornada, a Biogen, a Optican e a Netwish. Então, não tendo nenhuma uh, informação adicional, eu agradeço em nome da diretoria da SOBEP, a professora Manuela Domingues Martins, a professora Agda uh, e toda a equipe. Eu agradeço a presença de todos, uh, as questões enviadas, a interação, e nós encerramos a transmissão deste momento, então. Muito obrigado e boa tarde a todos.